Hello, we are back with another show, a closer look with Mark Shine and Mark Miller, and we're approaching the last week of the regular season here. Ladies start tournament this week, the guys start next week. It's a great time of year. It sure is. All right, well, let's review the great games we had last week. Some of them decided some championships. Some's got us closer. Mark's going to start. Well, let's start with Lima Senior and Finley, and what a rivalry game that's been over the years, and this was going to be one that we'll be talking about for a long time. Ryan Roth, well, he's been struggling a little bit lately, the Finley sharp shooting guard. He had 68 three-point made field goals on the season, but only one in the last two games. That was a school record, that 68. So how does he start this basketball game out? He makes seven three-point field goals in the first quarter. He's got wow. 21 points in the quarter, and Finley leads, obviously, 20, uh, 31 to 11 at the end of the first quarter. Finley still leads by 24 at halftime. The Spartans make a big run in the second half. They outscore Finley by 12 in the third quarter, 12 in the fourth quarter, and we're tied at 69 as we head into overtime. It's uh, Spartans are at 6-4 in overtime, and watch this move we're going to put on the screen for you right here. Ryan uh, Nunn spins into the lane, jump shot right here, and with that basket, we're going to go to the second overtime. We're in the third overtime here. B.J. Miller goes baseline, draws contact, and is fouled. He makes the basket, but he's unable to make the free throw because of his injury, so... Greg Johnson pops off the bench, makes the free throw. Lima Senior's up by two, but instead of that, here we get Ryan Roth. Steps in, makes yet another three-point field goal. That one from the parking lot, the different area code, whatever you want to say on it. And Finley wins 84-83. Here's that first move in the lane right there. That's the one that sends the second overtime. And then we're going to get the B.J. Miller move again baseline. B.J. had 34 points on an 11 of 25 shooting. He doesn't make this free throw because he's injured, but here's the play right here. Inbound, step back, and jumper, and bingo. And Ryan Roth makes that free throw. He ends up the game with 9 of 13 from the three-point line, plus three free throws. He's got 30 points. Miller had 34 for Lima Sr. And Ryan Young, none, yet another good game for him. He has 29 points, 11 of 23 field goals, 5 of 5 from the free throw line. How big is Ryan Nunn? Five, not five, eleven, nine, ten. Yeah, whatever. He's got eight rebounds. Hands out as usual. Big basket of assists. These two teams could meet again in the district semis with a little bit of winning action here and there. And this, they could meet for the third time as each team has won a game now. But Finley wins this one, 84-83 in three overtimes. He made that long shot three times in a row. That's a pretty good shooter. <laughs> good shooting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's look at Pandora Gilboa. They're doing something very special up there this year. On Friday night, they beat Liberty Benton, 51-32 to win the BVC championship. That's their first Blanchard Valley championship in 16 years, and they ran the table 9-0. They broke the stranglehold that Liberty Benton had had on that league title for years and years. Then on Saturday night, PG 51, Fort Jennings 38, to win the PCL, the Putnam County League Championship. They won that the second year in a row. For Fort Jennings, Brandon Weary, another double-double, 16 points, 13 rebounds for PG. Jared Brees, 14 points. Drew Johnson, 12 points, six rebounds. Three blocks, Riley Larkham had 13 points, including three threes and six rebounds. That is the first combo championship, BVC and PCL, ever at Pandora Gilboa. They're playing so well right now. They've won 13 in a row. Their record stands at 19-1, 6-0, getting ready for a big tournament run. Let's take a look at Miller City and Columbus Grove, also in the PCL. You think, well, why are we looking at those two teams? Well, they've both been on a roll lately. Columbus Grove, 4-1 and one in February. The only loss was to Pandora Gilboa. They had beaten Ada on Friday night with 15 on five three-point made field goals by Burnesser. Blake Reynolds had 11. Miller City was 6-1 and one since January 20th. The lone loss was to Perry. Close game all the way. Miller City actually gets a lead stretched out to eight points as we head to the fourth quarter. But, PG, or, but uh, Columbus Grove rallies. They lead 57-56 when Mark Kuhlman spins into the lane, gets fouled, makes a couple of free throws with 2.8 left. Uh, Otto knocks the ball loose on the inbounds pass, and Miller City defeats Columbus Grove, and that was a 58-57 win. Kuhlman had 11 points, another guard with 10 rebounds. Noah Otto had 18 points and 11 boards. Mitch Gable had 10. Uh, Blakeman, uh, Blake Reynolds, the freshman at Columbus Grove, 22 points and 7 boards. Got a feel for Columbus Grove. They've got three losses this year by a single point. They've played nine, they've lost 12 games, nine of them by nine points or less. Been a tough year for them. Maybe Grove gets to go on the tournament. All right, let's take a look at Marion Local, another team that's playing very well. On Friday night, 64 to 42, a winner over New Knoxville. That was a MAC game, and that's uh, since them a share of the championship. 
They're off to, they got off to a fast start in this game, up 18 to four at the end of the first quarter. Tyler Mesher, 14, Nathan Bruns, 13, Nick Tangeman, 10. You just say that in Mesher <laughs> Bruns, it, it just kind of rolls off your tongue. And then on Saturday night, a game that Mark and I did, Rushi down at Marion Local, a non-league game, Marion Local 58, Rushi 38, Jack Daypour led Rushi in scoring. They did not have a lot of energy Saturday night after a loss, a league loss, a tough one to Fort Loramie on Friday night. But Marion Local, it was a real team effort. New names this time, Colin Everman, Nick Tangeman, Justin Albers. They had great games. Those are usually not the names that lead them in scoring, but they did very well. A couple of them coming off the bench. Marion Local, 17 and four, eight and zero. They are gonna be a very difficult out in the tournament. They have one MAC game left for that championship all by themselves. Coldwater, Friday night, St. Henry, the only team with a chance to get a share, seven and one. They play New Bremen this weekend. All right, let's look at the NWCC, which actually finished up all their conference play this past weekend. They went into it with a tie at six and one. That was between USV and Elgin. So what happened with their opponents this weekend? Well, USV defeats Riverside 63-50. Riverside actually led by one at the end of the first quarter, but uh, outscoring them by 13 over the last three quarters did USV. Uh, Wyatt Daniels had 22, Brady Hipster had 17. Kyle Knight and Lane Willoughby had 12 apiece for Riverside. And if you're making three-point field goals, your first name is Trey Lane. <laughs> and he's got three three-point field goals for uh, Riverside. He had 11 points in the basketball game. And then USV defeated North Baltimore on Saturday night, 70-59. to They got things going right there. Quinn Sanders with 24, Lowry with 14, Daniels 13, Hipster 12. So things are going well right now. On the other side of that bracket, who tied them? Well, it was Elgin. And in typical Elgin manner, they defeated Hard Northern 62-28. They've been defensive-minded all year long. Colin Reif had 16. The other thing that's so common for uh, this Elgin team, they had five players score between six and eight points, so they get great balance there. So Elgin goes 7-1 in conference play, just like USC, and we have a tie in the Northwest Central Conference. All right, let's go to our stat stuffers now, and I got the first one, Eric Ritter. That's Tex Ritter's great-grandson. I'm joking. He's from Corey Ross, and he had 19 points, three threes, and a 55-44 win over Arcadia. He had 26 more, including another three, and an 89-42 win over Harden Northern. Talk about Harden Northern. Owen Weatherill had 28 points and six threes in that loss to Corey. We've been talking about Delphi St. John's every so often here, but they've kind of been flying under the radar this particular year, but not so with Connor Houlihan this weekend. For Delphi St. John's, he's got 18 points as Delphi St. John's defeats Bass 65-36. On those 18 points, six baskets from outside the three-point line for his 18 points. And DSJ looking good heading into the last weekend of the regular season at tournament with a win over Bath. Here's a familiar name we've said many times this year, Noah Howell from Temple. 15 points, four threes, and a loss to Lehman, 57-46. 15 more points and five threes, this time in a win over Ada, 56-46. Well, looking for a little bit something different in our stat categories this week. How about Dylan Thompson from USV? Well, you say he's only got five points, and we just read off his teammates who had a bunch of points in their win by 11 over North Baltimore, but Dylan Thompson had 17 assists in that basketball game, obviously setting his teammates up for a good win as USV defeated North Baltimore 70-59. 17, that's got to be like a school 17 record. assists, man. That's, that's dealing that thing out. That's dishing it out. All right, rule of the week. Hey, we got a lot All of reaction right. last week on that traveling thing. We had oh, uh, people requesting a repeat. We had people requesting that we use little stick figures or diagrams to explain it. I was, uh, I was going to volunteer to dive on a ball on the floor and roll over, but Mark's going to move on to the yeah. principle of verticality. You got a bad back. You have that tends you to that again if you yeah, dove on the I floor. Yeah, yeah, I know how that goes. All right, principle of verticality, one of those misunderstood rules. It's so important, it's got its own section in the rule book. Rule 4, section 45, it's got seven different articles trying to define this thing out. Here's what it says in basics. If you establish legal guarding position, that's Article 1, the defender may rise or jump vertically in his space. He may put his hands up in the air and rise or jump vertically in his space. As long as he's going straight up in the air, now we're to Article 4. He has from the floor to the ceiling, watch me jump to the ceiling, <laughs> he's got from the floor to the ceiling as long as he stays in his space. So how many off times do we see that offensive player come in, he forces the ball up into the hands, everybody wants a foul, it is not a foul on the defender if he is in his space, going straight up in the air. And of course, if the contact came down lower, you could actually be jumping off the floor like this, 
guy runs into you like a charging situation, that still can be a charge and a foul on the offensive player. Too often what happens, though, the defensive guy does this, and that's a foul because he leaves his plane and it creates a foul situation. But if that player jumps straight up in the air, as long as his hands are straight up in the air, that foul goes on the offensive player or there's no call whatsoever trying to force the ball through his hands. And here we see this sometimes, too. A guy jumps and the defender backs under him. Backs under him. Now, that's, that's not right. giving him his that's verticality right. space yeah. to come back to the floor, right? The principle of verticality. The principle of verticality is not the leader of a school in a hill country. <laughs> Principal, good job. Principal, yep. Hey, you know it's a good week when we got a lot of bright spots, and we do this week. Let's look at Columbus Grove and the Ada girls game. The reason we like this game a lot is Paige Bellman, what a great player. She had a preseason ACL knee injury that kept her out of the whole season, and we really missed seeing her, and her teammates really missed her, but boy, some others stepped up, and they still had a great year. But in this game against Ada, I don't know how it was arranged. The coaches, athletic directors, somebody had some plan and what happened is after the center jump, Ada was allowed to go undefensed in and make a layup. And then Columbus Grove got the ball, and they went down to the other end of the floor and gave the ball to Paige Bellman, and she, undefensed, made a layup. Her only points of the season, her last basket on that home gym floor, and I think that is a real class move by those two coaches and those two teams to let Paige Bellman have a basket in her last game. That, Isn't that that's, cool? That's really cool, Mark. You know, when you got a couple coaches, a couple teams willing to get together and celebrate a player in your league and her accomplishments, that's a really cool thing. Then they just played the game. It was 2-2, two yeah, to two, no advantage anybody. That's right. You just play the game as Paige then went to the bench because she's still not healthy enough to play, but she will be healthy next year. She's going to go to Detroit Mercy and play basketball, and we wish her nothing but a lot of good luck. All right, I got a couple of milestones we're going to throw at you tonight. First of all, Seth Newlove from Arlington. He's the ladies coach at Arlington has his 200th win. He got in the game with, against Riverdale, in which Arlington won 72-64. Jenna Peppel had 32 in that game. You know, Mark, here's what I like about Arlington. Now, Dick Leonard coached football there forever. Earlier this year, we had Jason Vermillion, the men's coach. He's got 300 wins. He's been there a long time. Seth Newlove there, he's been there for 10 years. So when you get a good coach at Arlington, you hang on to him, and congratulations for that. 200 wins, 44 losses in his 10 years at Arlington. Then we got another one of our 1,000-point milestones, Nick Mormon from Ottoville. He had 15 in their win against Lipsick, and he goes over 1,000 points in his career, does Nick Mormon from Ottoville. All right, that club is growing. It it's is. that time of year? Yes, it is. Hey, we want to thank Nick and Julie Schultze. Nick is on the District 8 FCA board with Mark and I, and he and Julie invited us to their home, along with all of our crew, before the Marion Local game. They live just down the road from Marion Local High School. They invited some friends of theirs. Uh, former coach Jack Albers was there. Superintendent Mike Pullman was there. And they put a spread on like you wouldn't believe. Here's some of the crew. There's uh, Micah and Abby loaded up. Uh, and we had a great meal, great conversation. And then we went over and did that game against Rushi. But thanks so much to Nick and Julie Schultze for serving up the crew. And Mark and I, and the friends, a great meal. I had a chance to talk to Jack Albers. And we know Jack Albers, one of the best basketball coaches around in the 80s, 70s and 80s down at Marion Local. Did a great job there. Was also on the state math board and did a lot to revitalize the math curriculum in Ohio. And when he did that well, on the state board, and on, I had a chance to talk to him. What a fascinating guy, Jack Albers. I enjoyed that as much as the food, and the food was really good. The first question somebody asked me when I told him I, saw, I had dinner with Jack Albers, they said, did he have his towel with him? <laughs> yes, right. He's on the sideline. Is, is he playing matchup zone or has he got his yeah, towel? This was the calmest <laughs> I've ever seen Jack Albers, but that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, this is not a commercial, but we're pretty sure all that meat came from Winner's yeah. Market in Osgood. But, oh, man, did Abby have two, two pork chops on her plate? Oh, at least. It looked like at it. Come least. on, Abby. Hey, our good buddy, if you watch the Kenton Elida replay that we did on Friday night over at Kenton, Jerry Snodgrass, OHSAA Assistant Commissioner, and our former colleague here at WOSN used to do a lot of games with us, head coach, athletic director at Finley High School for years and years, joined us for the broadcast as he does once every year. And it's a special night for us, and we got together with the cameraman, Aaron Baker, before the game and did an interview with Jerry. Listen in now. It is our annual game that we get to have our good friend and former colleague Jerry Snodgrass with us. Do a game. Mark will join us later for the game. But 
Uh, Jerry, the assistant commissioner, the OHSA in Columbus. I guess your your real title is director of sport management, and we jokingly think that's because you run almost all the sports down there. Is that I didn't get a whole lot of say in what that title was. I didn't get to create my own title. Well, that leaves them open to add more it sports does. to you. But yep. Jerry's in charge of many of the sports. But we wanted to take a minute to uh, talk about some of the things going on down there. Of course, everybody realizes recently that Dr. Ross uh, has announced uh, his plans for retirement out of the commissioner's position. And Jerry, a, a question everybody asks is, how do you go about picking a new commissioner? Would you describe that process for us? Well, you know, first of all, I would say this, you know, that the the task is undaunting. I mean, it's it's a, an incredible responsibility to lead 350,000 student athletes, you know, keep it educational based, knowing that 99% of them are not going to go to the next level and keep focused on that. And I think it's a very difficult task to replace. It's also one that uh, uh, I think our board of directors were very similar to a school district in that our elected board of directors that represents all areas of the state and all sizes of schools and minorities, and we have gender equity on there, to, to seek out who that best candidate is and, you know, for the benefit of our schools, for the benefit of our student athletes, working for them. And I think they plan on having that sewn up by June 1st. Okay, well that's not going to take that long. They are very aggressive in their approach for that and I think partly knowing that the vision, the direction, uh, the path of the organization needs to go forth as soon as possible. And, and how do they pick a new commissioner? I mean, uh, is, is it a vote? Is it a recommendation? Is it a board appointment? What is it? And that's a very good question. A lot of people probably would not know. Uh, it is hired just like a school district's school board would hire a superintendent to lead its uh, school district where there will be a cert there is a search committee uh, there's actually a succession committee that will be involved I know that our own staff is involved from the standpoint of surveys things like that uh, I was informed uh, yesterday at a board meeting that all districts in the state of Ohio which we have six athletic uh, districts will have someone on the committee to do the reviewing, or excuse me, to do the interviewing. The idea is that applications are open. I, I saw that it was, the deadline for application is March 9th. Uh, bachelor's degree, you know, preferred. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's particulars of it, mm -hmm. or required, I should say. Um, and then narrowed down, and again, interviews sometime in April, mm -hmm. with the final decision being recommended to the board of directors to be approved by June 1st. All right. Well, we can count this as the official kickoff for our support of Jerry Snodgrass as the next commissioner. Jerry, you've done so many great things down there and implemented so many new programs. We, we just think, of course, we're biased. We know you, but you do a great job down there. We hope that you're considering that. Well, I, I am considering it. I will openly tell you that. I think some of us, you know, through the years, we go back to our Bowling Green days, and, you know, you always want leadership positions. And I've always said, you know, when I was an assistant coach, I aspired to be a head coach. When I was an assistant athletic director, I aspired to be an athletic director. When I was an assistant commissioner, that didn't change. I aspired, mm -hmm. if the opportunity presented itself, uh, to mm -hmm. be the commissioner. It's just, you know, sometimes I think in leadership, you aspire to be in those leadership roles. Um, I also know that I want what's good for our school districts. And if that's, if I'm not the candidate, life will go on and our school systems will benefit either way. And I will say this, I, I can say this where we're at, I'm a Northwest Ohio guy. I still maintain my home in Northwest Ohio. Um, and, and it's unique in Northwest Ohio, more so than sometimes people just maybe take for granted. But so much of what occurs in high school sports, the tone is set because of the community involvements, the smaller communities, 78, I think it is, Division Four schools alone in Northwest Ohio. And I, and I think that's helped me in my background. Yep, I think so too. Mark Shine will be campaign manager. I will be the financial. <laughs> All right, let's talk about something else that's going on down there. We saw in the paper recently a proposal that has to do with uh, transfer and recruiting. Talk about those issues. That's always at the top of the list around the state. It, it is at the top of the state, top, top of the state, especially when you look at 
you advance to the state basketball tournament, for example, and, you know, the Northwest Ohio schools, the small schools in particular, and the Division threes and fours, all of a sudden are going up against, you know, these conglomerates, you know, that small enrollments, but kids coming from everywhere. Now, I will say that the competitive balance that was implemented a couple of years ago, no one knows yet if it works. I was asked recently, is it working? It's hard to tell. But I think it was put in as at least a step in the right direction. And I do believe that. It's a step. Um, now, I will say that one of the biggest issues facing high school sports in Ohio have to do with transferring and recruiting. Part of it's the sign of the times. If you don't like something over here, go over here and play. And I think that's so against the high school model. It is very difficult to control that. It's hard to believe, but with 821 member schools, we are still an organization that requires, requ relies on self-enforcement. If you did something wrong, turn yourself in. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tough thing in today's world. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when I tell media people that, they just laugh, like, really? Well, that's the way it is. I think we're being challenged with that. And I think as a result of that, people are taking advantage of a lot of the opportunities that freely allow them to go from one school to the next. So all of a sudden, a basketball team, and primarily in the sport of basketball, a team that exists this year that loses all of its players, all of a sudden magically comes up with all these new players. And something does have to be done. There is a proposal to change that transfer bylaw. If you do not meet any exception, in other words, if you don't move from school A to school B. If you want to go from school A to school B, currently you must sit out the first 50% of the season. The proposal that our schools must vote on to approve, we are dr member driven, is to make them ineligible for the second half of the season and the tournament. And when you say that to someone, instantly they'll say, well, that will stop the transferring from going from school A to school B. And that's the intent. Yes. The fundamental belief in our organization and by our member schools is we want kids to stay where they're at. Schools want that. We want that. And I think this is an attempt to get back to that. All right. Sounds good. Well, tonight... And then next week, for a lot of the state, ends the regular season. Some teams start tournament next week. You are in charge of the girls' and boys' state tournament in basketball. It's a crazy time for you right now. Could you it? please throw that I also have <laughs> ice hockey in there right oh, now, too? Wow. So it is a very unique time. And, and, you know, when you talked about, you know, having the different sports that I have, it truly is an athletic administrator's dream to do what I do. Um, I love the organization. I love the pieces. I love the moving parts. I love on Friday night or Saturday of the state basketball tournament to stand on that end and watch it all come together, make it work, know that you had a hand in all the moving parts of that. And, you know, some, some crazy things trip some people's mind, and that's just one of the organizational aspects that I just absolutely love. Well, you do a great job at it, and we're glad to have you back. We're about to go do a ball game, and thanks a lot, Jerry, for joining well, us. Well, I thank you guys. I mean, thank you. We've talked about how long we, you and all the, TV, uh, the WSN have done this, and I also hope that I can see you in the front row at the state tournament here in March. Oh, Mark and I wouldn't miss it. Uh, right. Highlight of the year. Thanks right. a lot, Jerry. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back with more of the show. It is time now for Plays of the Week, and we are going to start with the game, Elida at Kenton. Well, Mark, coaches talk about purposeful movement. That means with the ball and by players, and what they like to have is the ball start on one side, take the ball towards the baseline, make the defense drop, switch the ball to the other side, and so you've got the defense moving to the baseline, and then horizontally and vertically as well. Elida does that very well as we look at our first play. Elida's in the orange here. Here's the ball, goes baseline, it goes cross court, top of the circle, there's Isaac McAdams open for a three. That's a very well done play. Look at it again. This is going to be Skyler Smith. He goes baseline, draws the defense. Here's Callan Henderson here. The catch, the immediate pass. Sherman got caught deep inside trying to help out, and McAdams knocks down the three ball. That's taking the ball to the baseline, then going side to the top of the circle. Then T.C. Smith makes a great play. Unruh's supposed to be the primary receiver on this play. 
He's supposed to catch the ball and shoot in the corner, but Smith realizes the defense is overplayed. And that allows Parker to sneak open in the middle right here. He's going to come off the screen right there. The defense is confused, so they go to option two, and there's a basket for Elida. We all know how well they run their sets. That's option two in that one. And then we're going to see one, another play by T.C. Smith. Here's the pass right here, and we're going to get the step back. And here comes off the double screen, and this is a favorite Elida play. McAdams gets the flare screen right there and knocks in the three ball coming off that screen. He'll help set the screen right here and pop out to this wing. Here's the play. And sometimes you get this, and sometimes the defense reacts, and there's a second part to this. But watch him come off the screen right here. And Isaac had a great game, didn't he? In this he particular sure game, did. really got it yep. going again. And one of the reasons that they're scoring right now is he goes up and strokes the three ball right there. Then we have a couple plays, and I like this because I'm an old post player. Emphasis on old. old. Watch Pranger and Mesher inside. Here's Mesher 32, and he reposts. Throw it inside, then accepts contact and scores. <laughs> I like that guy, don't you? Anyway, here's the repost. The pass goes in. He realizes he's a little bit low on the baseline. Kick it out. Repost. Deeper in the post line. This post this time. And then the move inside and the contact. And you just got to like how he plays the Vintage game, don't measure, you? Vintage yep. And this is another play I like with him because he's supposed to be the dump down passer on this one. But he realizes the defense has gone down inside. It's helping down inside as they help down in here. Mesher pops up right here, watches man, I'm going to help down in here. He can't score out there. Yes, he can. And he steps up and nails the jump shot. So he scored in the low post. And he also recognizes he's supposed to be the passer here, but he sees where his defender is gone. As we get the screen action right here, he comes up into this area right here around the top of the circle. He wants to dump it down inside and realizes that his teammate Tangeman's in the low post and can't get, to, can't get open because his defender is slumped back in. And so he says, okay, I got this. And Coach Cuttermore is going to like this, too, at the bottom of the screen. I got this, Tyler Mesher. We're going to do our favorite players segment in a week or so. Think he'll be on the list? Think he'll be on the list. <laughs> Best players, favorite players. All right. Hey, good job, Coach Shire. We'll be right back with a final segment. All right, welcome back for the final segment. We're time, it's time to preview some of the great games we got coming up. I get to start. Perry, 13 and 7. They play at Lincoln View, 14 and 7. Perry beat Botkin 62-49. Logan Dre, 24 points and four threes. He really heating up here at the end of the season. Lincoln View beat Paulding. That's a tough one. 65-54. The team had 12 threes. And then on Saturday, they turn around and beat Arlington, 55-39. Chayton Overholt. Lead them in scoring, had 27 on the weekend. All right, and the game that Mark and I will be doing this weekend, that's Elida at 18-3 at Ottawa Glendorf at 20-1. Ottawa Glendorf has won the Western Buckeye League. That's their 18th championship. That tied, uh, broke a tie they had with Salina. Nine of those have been outright, and nine of them have been uh, shared championships for Ottawa Glendorf. In 51 years of playing basketball in the Western Buckeye League, They've won 65.3% of their Western Buckeye League games. They're 294 and 156 in their career in the Western Buckeye League. We've talked about the names. Kaufman leads them in scoring. Also in double figures are Hegel, White, and Dybel. And Schrader and Herringhouse can shoot the ball from the three-point line. Elias started to come alive a little bit recently. They had a couple of wins last weekend over Kenton and over Jefferson. And they got scoring from some other guys this time. In the two games, Isaac McAdams had 36. Dante Johnson had 29, Kalen Henderson 24, and Skyler Smith had 20 against Jefferson alone, including six three-point field goals. This will be a good matchup. It always is in a good tournament prep game. That's right. Let's go to the Northwest Conference. Crestview, 18-3, 7-0 in first place. They play at Columbus Grove Friday night. Crestview beat Spencerville 89-43, and then on Saturday they beat New Knoxville 68-32. They're getting scoring from Javen Etzler, Derek Dealey, Derek Stout, some good support. Everybody seems to rise up and hit it when they need it. Their only challenger, Northwest Conference, Lincoln views at 6-1 in second place. Grove, as Mark mentioned earlier, they've lost a lot of close games. That freshman Blake Reynolds has given them some scoring. This will be a tough one for Grove, but what a way to end the season if they could get the upset. All right, into the MAC, and we get down to the MAC right now. It's Coldwater at Marion Local. Coldwater is 11 and 10, 3 and 5. Marion Local 17 and 4, 8 and 0. And Marion Local needs to win this one to have the championship outright in the MAC. 
This is their 10th championship. They've, they've won five and tied for four other ones. They trail St. Henry, who's won 13, and St. Henry is just a game back. And if St. Henry can defeat New Bremen, and if Coldwater can upset Marion Local, we'd have a two-way tie at the top of the championship. If you look back, Marion Local ended the 2017 part of the season with a 3-2 record. In fact, they had a 53-49 loss to Coldwater during that particular time period. But in January and February, Marion Local's 14-2. Their losses are to Anna and Fort Laramie, so they're really on a roll lately. Coldwater's 4-2 in February. It's a three-point loss to Fort Recovery in there, plus a loss to Versailles. They beat Wapak on Saturday night, 54-49. Cole Frilly had 13. Seems like he leads them in scoring most weeks. Seven other players scored. This will be a good matchup of two teams heading into the tournament, both of whom can do some real damage in the tournament. Yep, Coldwater's a dangerous team to they play. Are. Wayne Trace, 17-4 at Ottoville, 15-5. What a great non-league matchup this is. Wayne Trace beat Tenora 51-22, only gave up 22 points. Yeah. They are co-champs of the Green Meadows Conference with Hicksville, and that is also their sixth league championship in a row. Ottoville beat Lipsick 71-45. Ryan Seaver had 17 points and two threes. Nick Mormon, who Mark talked about going over 1,000, had that 15 with three threes. And Ryan Bendeley, 12 points with two threes. This is a great way to get ready for tournament. This is a really good non-league matchup at the end of the season. All right, let's get into our broadcast schedule then. A lot of good games coming your way. This will lead us right into the tournament. Girls games are starting to come up this weekend. And also then we start the boys the following weekend. And hey, how about a live college men's and women's game at Finley versus Hillsdale. We'll be up there Saturday afternoon. That'll be a lot of fun. Then you see the, the wrestling sneaks in there. We got the Wapakoneta and Kenton girls, that Wayne Trace Autoville game I just mentioned. Stay tuned. Watch lots of basketball. We appreciate you joining us. We'll be back next week with another look at a closer look.